Good morning, everyone. My name is Jonathan Veach. I'm the president of Oxnell College for a little while longer. Uh, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the uh, Occidental celebration of the life of Bob Winner. And while we're mourning the loss of our friend and colleague, celebration seems the only appropriate term to apply to a life so joyous, so passionate, so inspiring, and so irrepressible. Uh, I had the good, great fortune to get to know Bob in the last 10 years of his life. And even then, he was a big personality. You could tell the kind of impact he had on his students. He was bold, dramatic. Uh, his love for the material was infectious. That picture of him in full flight like this, I think, captures it all. Very few of us, as we get older, can one tell what you were like or one was like uh, in one's full-throated youth. But Bob carried that all the way through uh, to his 90s. And in fact, even rehearsed his uh, famous fainting routine for me uh, in his living room. The fainting routine that would accompany some bold new idea that was just so dramatic, it had to be accompanied by some uh, uh, extra theatrics. Bob retired from Occidental in 1994 after teaching here for 31 years. His, former, his formal title was the Arthur G. Coons Professor of the History of Ideas. But as you all know, his influence extended far beyond the classroom. He was a nationally known teacher, scholar, author, and activist whose work changed the way we look at Los Angeles and its built environment. Only Bob could turn out a crowd like this and this diverse with people from academia, city government, nonprofits, the preservation movement, former students, former colleagues, chamber music aficionados, architectural historians, urban planners, artists, former students. Have I missed uh, a category? I doubt it. Uh, and every one of us, who, uh, every one of us considered Bob a friend. To be in his company was both a joy and an honor. We've asked a small group of Bob's friends and colleagues to share their memories of this remarkable man this morning. I'd like to begin by asking Lynn Duminell and Norm Cohn, two of Bob's longtime colleagues from Occidental's History Department, to get us started. Lynn and Norm. Good morning. Uh, it would be tempting to talk about Bob's and our friendship, a personal story. He was a dear friend of mine for over 30 years. And mine for over 50. Um, he went on our first date. I think he viewed himself as a chaperone. He also went on our honeymoon, which is a story we won't be talking about. But we want to talk briefly about Bob as a teacher and a scholar. And to do that, I just want to tell a little story that happened last, last summer. Uh, many of you may know that he'd had a bad fall a year ago and was in rehab, a facility, for a while. And when I went to see him back in his house, when he was back to his routine, he said that the worst thing about rehab was that he couldn't write. He didn't have his books. He didn't have his computer. And that morphed into a conversation I'd never had with him before about the joy and angst of writing how you can't sleep at night because you're worried about organization, and then the joy when you finally figure out how to fix that pesky introductory paragraph, right? And then at the same kind of discussion, um, Bob was working on women in the arts and crafts movement, and so I said, would you like me to send you some articles on early 20th century feminism? And he said yes, and I was a little condescending because I thought, well, this is really far from his field. And if he read them immediately and with such engagement and interest, it was really quite quite a lovely uh, uh, conversation. So what's the moral of this story? Um, not so much about the cliche of growing old with grace. I think rather Bob is an inspiration for growing old with engagement and with passion. For me, uh, Bob was a Hoosier through and through, born in Elkhart, Indiana, his childhood home on Lexington Avenue, which ran parallel to the St. Joe River. His dad was a newspaper editor, his mom a school teacher. 
It was here in the Midwest that his interest in architecture began, as he tells the story in his book, which is a marvelous book, by the way, At Home in the Heartland. On Strong Avenue, right around the corner from where Bob lived, stood the magnificent mansion of C.G. Kahn. Kahn was the maker of brass musical instruments, a friend of the family as well. When visiting the house with, it, with its gigantic white columns, Jim, Bob's younger brother, then two years old, said, it's a Thirsch church. And no, said Bob, who was the older and wiser brother by two years, it's an Iberry. Much of Bob's interest in architecture and his basic belief that houses, the main purpose of houses was social organized in his livid, lived experience from Elkhart. Bob wrote lovingly of homes with comfortable living rooms facing fireplaces, preferably artistically tiled. In Bob's ideal, there should be a piano or some other source of music in the room where the family could gather in the evening. He cites as an example of the simple idea the Frank House in Fort Wayne, Indiana, where rather than a piano, music was played by a 400-stop pipe organ, and the tiles over the fireplace depicted a nude Adam and Eve, which was too much for Mrs. Frank, and she tiled it over again, making Adam and Eve closed. Bob said in his book, it's a pity. While architecture and tiles were central to Bob's interests, music was essential to Bob. In his Arroyo Bungalow, he played his viola in a string quartet gathered in front of the gigantic Bach shoulder fireplace. He loved telling stories of the many famous musicians who had performed in that room before him. Bob loved his viola. He played in the Oxycal Tech Orchestra for a while Bob did not like viola jokes, though. Often when he walked, as he walked, he would finger the, the viola behind his back as if he was playing. It was air of viola he played on back. And, this, and he walked with music as a guide. Bob cared for his mother until her death in the Batchholder home on the Arroyo that she always said was too dark but he brightened her bedroom with authentic William Morris wallpaper purchased, purchased from, the, from the English company that acquired the rights from the, orig the original Morris and Company. Other than his mother, Bob's most significant other was Occidental College, where he taught for 31 years. When he was denied tenure at UCLA, Occidental President Arthur Coons snatched him up, giving him the title of Professor of History of Ideas and History. And Bob said that just meant history of architecture. <laughs> Bob had very little good to say about UCLA's architecture. But coming to the, what he called, regionalized Palladiism of Myron Hunt's Occidental campus, its magnificent landscaping by the landscape architect Beatrix Ferrand was for him a real joy. Oxy to him was home. At Oxy Thorn Hall now became his stage where he performed magnificently to his own music that he heard from within. When lecturing, he gyrated, as we've seen, across the stage with a plie here, a jeté there, even a grand jeté to point out something high. His hand thrown to the ceiling, he was truly an architectural musical wonder. Many of you have seen him lecture here in Thorn Hall, and you know what I mean. I once tried to replicate uh, one of his lectures where I was giving a talk on the relationship between medieval architecture and medieval music, and gave what was undoubtedly the worst lecture ever given in Thorn Hall. But boy, did that give job Bob pleasure. He laughed about it for years and teased me about it for years. 
Bob's students loved him. His architectural history of LA was one of the most popular courses ever taught at the college. Bob did not like the title LA on a six pack, which was, it was known as. And Bob led many tours for friends, colleagues, the Oxy community, and people with interest in architecture. I remember his taking the history department, faculty and students on a tour of Catalina Island, and another where we visited the houses where famous immigre writers, immigres from Nazi Germany, such as Thomas Mann, fleeing from Hitler, lived in LA. He gave us this wonderful tour of their houses. He even gave Lynn and me a tour once of cemeteries in LA. He knew everything about the city. When Bob retired, he gave most of his time, more of his time, to his work on the LA and Pasadena Historical Preservationist Commissions. He lived long enough to see a new edition of his architectural guide in Los Angeles appear in print, thanks to Robert Inman, and offer his opinion on the Broad Museum, Broad Museum. He liked the holdings. When he went to the Bowdoin Museum, he had an absolute joy in walking through the, the, art, the art itself. But he said the outside of the building was terrible. And of the switch art architecture, Peter Zumthor's new vision of LACMA, its extension, Bob did not like it, and he called it Trumpetecture. <laughs> I can turn the page, I'll get there. What Bob never wavered on was his love of and gratitude to Occidental College, where he left his beautiful home to the college along with the memories and memorialization that we memorialize today. Um, hello, I'm Ann Scheid uh, from Pasadena, and I'm going to talk about Bob's uh, legacy in Pasadena, which is a great one. Um, he always styled himself Dr. Robert W. Winter, PhD. Um, it was just like Bob to want both titles in his name, doctor and PhD, and he loved them both. First, he had earned them both, as a matter of fact. First, he was PhD in history from Johns Hopkins, and second, he was, had an honorary degree from Oxy. So Bob was a modest man, but he loved glory. I first met Bob in his living room on the Arroyo in Pasadena in connection with the exhibition of California Design 1910. This was in 1974. Bob spoke about Pasadena's Arroyo culture, a term he coined to describe the work of the architects, writers, artists, and craftsmen who created Pasadena's distinctive built environment in the early 20th century. This landmark exhibition raised awareness in the community and across the country, as a matter of fact, of Pasadena's unique contribution to American culture. Later, Bob told me he had been to Princeton a couple of years before to participate in the first arts and crafts exhibition in this country. And when he returned to Pasadena, he told his friends, we can do better, and they did. Bob wanted to preserve that legacy, so he became active in Pasadena's politics. He wrote Pasadena's Cultural Heritage Ordinance together with the um, LA Times columnist Miv Schaff, who lived just around the corner from him and discovered the Batchelder House for him. So he bought it. Um, the ordinance was the initial step in preserving the historic landmarks and landmark districts that characterize Pasadena today. Miv promoted preservation in her newspaper column and Bob did the legwork going around to give numerous talks in town to civic groups, clubs, and the city council. Bob's talks were fun, as you well know, and always ended with his unforgettable rendition of In the Land of the Bungalow. I ended up volunteering for the Architectural Survey of Pasadena, which was a result of the Cultural Heritage Ordinance, and there was Bob, serving on the survey review committee. We were all pioneers. This was the first architectural survey in California, and we were documenting the work of Pasadena's great architects and discovering the beginnings of the bungalow and bungalow courts, which originate in Pasadena. This led to the landmarking of hundreds of historic buildings and, 
and many historic districts in Pasadena, and that was all directly as a result of Bob's early advocacy of historic preservation. Bob often said that the entire city should be listed in the National Register of Historic Places, and I think he was right. Bob took up the cause of the bungalow. His book on the subject drew national attention to this common building type that originated in Southern California and earned him the title of Bungalow Bob. He wrote many books, ironically, after having been dismissed from UCLA for no, not publishing enough. He ended up writing, I think, at least 15 books, um, some while he was still a uh, professor here at Oxy and later in his retirement. He wrote on architects, architecture, and arts and crafts, but his greatest contribution is undeniably uh, the guide to Southern California architecture, written first in 1965 and now in its sixth edition, as was mentioned earlier. Um, these guides informed the general public about the city and perhaps even gave Eastern tourists something to admire in a city they often disparaged. Following the tragic death of David Gebhardt, Bob turned to me when it was time for the fifth edition of the guide. For several months, we set out on Sunday mornings at nine o'clock to explore LA's many different neighborhoods. No traffic, beautiful weather, it was a joy. We sought out new buildings for inclusion in the new edition and checked to see if older buildings were still standing, which often resulted in disappointment. But we capped the morning with lunch, and uh, Bob had his famous martini, and I had my glass of wine. And Bob, we had many uh, discussions about architecture and about politics and all sorts of other things. And um, Bob once complained to me, you argue with me even when I agree with you. <laughs> Which I'm afraid was true. <laughs> anyway. We also had season tickets together to the Philharmonic where we spent many evenings enjoying the music we both loved. And he introduced me also to the Coleman Chamber Concerts uh, which occur in Pasadena. Uh, there's a series every year and it's absolutely outstanding uh, quality, uh, with an absolutely outstanding quality of music and performers. And uh, crossed my mind when um, uh, Norm and Lynn were talking about architecture and music and how uh, Thomas Mann once said, and I don't think the quote originated with him, that architecture is frozen music. There is a connection there. Um, anyway, when John and I moved from Altadena to the Mannheim house on, the Arroyo, on Arroyo Boulevard in Bob's neighborhood, Bob teasingly demanded that I bring him casseroles for dinner. Little did he know that I am the world's least enthusiastic cook, so his hopes were dashed, but living to, so close to each other cemented our friendship even more. In later years, we lunched regularly every Saturday, mostly at Columbo's in Eagle Rock, where some of you have also enjoyed Bob's company. Those were memorable lunches, um, always talking about big ideas. Uh, Bob was always trying out his big ideas on us to see if we, if we agreed or not, and you know, we had these discussions. Anyway, Bob was a charismatic speaker, and I think that was one of his great strengths. I always thought he would have been a great actor. His speaking, his speaking performances were truly theatrical. And this is what made him so effective as an educator and as a public speaker to citizens, not just at the college, but, in, but to the general public. Bob was a great t thinker uh, with original and big ideas that he pursued in his writings. But perhaps his greatest contribution to Pasadena and to Los Angeles was bringing the appreciation of our architectural legacy to ordinary people and thereby creating a popular movement to save that legacy. Bob left his house to Oxy because he loved this place so much. That house is a unique work of art, the creation of four artists. Ernest Batchelder, uh, who was a famous ceramicist, and as you know, the house and its garden are filled with his work, and Douglas Donaldson, who was a famous metal worker of the arts and crafts movement, and many of the fixtures in Bob's house, lighting fixtures are by Donaldson. 
Francis Dean, the second owner, who together with Garrett Ekbo created modern California landscape design right here in Los Angeles. And Dean designed the elegant walled pool on the property. Bob bought the house from Dean and he preserved it, adding his distinctive furnishings and other touches to the house and garden to make it a home. Now all of us must take the responsibility to be its guardians. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Linda Dishman and I am the president and CEO of the Los Angeles Conservancy. I knew the guide before I knew Bob Winter. In 1982, the city of Pasadena hired me as staff to the Cultural Heritage Commission. But before I moved to Pasadena, I was urged by many people to buy the Gebhardt and Winter Guide to Southern California. How could I do preservation if I didn't have the guide? So I did buy it, and once I got to LA, I saw the guide everywhere, usually on the dashboard of a parked car, and often alongside a Thomas Brothers map book, a great combo before Siri and GPS. Bob told me once that his goal was to bring architecture to the people. His focus on the intersection of people and place helped make the shift within the preservation movement. We now focus on how architecture helps us experience and understand the history of people and places and how places connect us. For many years, the Gebhardt and Winter Guide served as the de facto survey of historic resources in greater Los Angeles. In the early 1990s, when I was at the LA Conservancy, the owners of the historic Golden Gate Theater in East LA proposed demolition. There was a hearing and their attorney stood up and proclaimed with great authority that the building was no longer historic because it had been dropped from the latest edition of the guide. <laughs> I called Bob right after the meeting, asked what about this? And he said in that nonchalant way of his, oh, it must have dropped off the table when we were editing. At the next hearing, I was able to testify with great authority and present a handwritten letter from Bob Winter stating that the Golden Gate Theater was still historic, should not be removed from the National Register, and would be included in the next edition of the guide. <laughs> the owner's effort failed, and Bob was delighted to have played a significant role in stopping the demolition. The Gebhardt and Winter guides were just the beginning of Bob's preservation efforts. Bob knew that admiring historic buildings were not necessarily going to save them. And as Anne mentioned, Bob and Miv Schaff drafted the first preservation ordinance for the city of Pasadena. And Bob served on, that, on the commission that was created as part of that ordinance for various terms between 1983 and 2006. It was while Bob was on the Pasadena Cultural Heritage Commission that I got to know him, his knowledge, and most definitely his wit. In a public hearing, humor is not always appreciated, but Bob did not care. He liked being quotable and quoted. One of his most notable quotes came when he served on the Los Angeles Cultural Heritage Commission from 1972 to 1984. In 1977, the, the commission designated the folk art Tower of Wooden Pallets in San Fernando Valley, a circular tower made of wooden pallets from the nearby Bush Brewery. That designation was questioned in a 1988 LA Times article. When asked why the commission designated the Tower of Pallets, Bob responded, maybe we were drunk. <laughs> he told me that story many times. I think he told it to me many times because he knew it terrified me that people would think that decisions about landmark designation were not serious and thoughtful deliberations. And because of that story, I always stayed right with him, right next to him, if I knew the press was in the room. <laughs> in addition to laws that protect historic buildings, Bob had the foresight to understand that government can't do everything. He was at the center of the first conversations to found both Pasadena Heritage and the Los Angeles Conservancy. He continued to advise and assist both organizations as they developed in their own ways to be powerful voices for preservation. And Bob walked the walk. He didn't just ask or tell people to preserve historic buildings. He purchased and lived in the Batchelder House until his death. Whenever someone knocked on his door, he would let them in to see the magnificent interior. 
This fact wasn't included in the guide, but it was a fairly well-known secret. One of Bob's favorite comments was, well, if the story isn't true, it should be. <laughs> Not exactly what you would expect from a professor with a PhD in history, but his descriptions of history and buildings were entertaining and engaging. His goal was to lure people into the preservation circle one story at a time. The Los Angeles Conservancy gave several awards to Bob, including the President's Award in 2009. Upon receiving the award, he spoke from the heart about why preservation matters. It was personal, it was commanding, and most of all, it was entertaining. Everyone in the room was inspired. One attendee was so overcome by his comments that he came up to me after the event and very sincerely said, I want to save a building. That was the power of Bob. While he drafted ordinances, served on commissions, including the State Historic Resources Commission, and helped launch preservation nonprofits, his main gift was to inspire the believers and the not yet believers. He always left people wanting another story, another laugh, and another chorus of the bungalow song. Bob was a friend and a mentor who had a huge influence on my career. While I learned a great deal from him about the why and the how of preservation, the gift I treasure most from him was the infectious sense of absolute joy that comes from saving historic places. Thank you, Bob. Hi there, I'm Bob Inman, class of 72. It's wonderful that we're all here today. For all my fortunate visits to the Batchelor House, where Bob Winter lived half of his 94 years, I also have a strong impression of Bob in his prior home, a 1915 craftsman, not a thousand feet from here, this way, where he held his classes when I was a student here. Bob's teaching style was lots of reading, lots of essays, and memorable group discussions. We sat around him in his living room. Some of us sat on the floor. Often his mother baked us cookies. I can remember Bob tracing with his finger on an Asian rug as he tried to instill in us the basics of organic principle. After I left Occidental, Bob and I stayed in touch off and on through the decades. But in 2015, at the end of the year, he asked me if I would like to take over getting out the sixth edition of this guidebook we've been talking about to Los Angeles Architecture, a project that he started 50 years prior with Professor David Gebhardt. David Gebhardt had passed away in 1996 and the fifth edition uh, that Bob put out on his own um, uh, was now getting a little aged. It had been put out in 2003. And I knew it was really missing an energetic field check and an update. So uh, it pained me to think that um, if that, that book was still out on the bookshelf, say in 2020 or 2025, that it might ultimately distract from his reputation. So I knew a new edition was definitely a worthy project, and I was intimidated yet overjoyed to join in the effort. Bob would comb through the old version repeatedly and make lists of things for me to remove, things to reevaluate, to correct, to rewrite. One of the joys for both of us in this process came because Bob had a baseline level of expectation that was formed in the battle days of Los Angeles 30 to 60 years ago. This is when our landmarks were getting demolished left and right. Bob's handwritten notes to me um, about uh, individual entries could be looked at, I looked at as a you know, list of pessimistic pleas. Is the coffee pot in Long Beach still there? Is there anything left of CBS Columbia Square? Is Lloyd Wright's Johnson House still that perfect shade of lavender? Do the murals on Farmer John still exist? So imagine my joy when I could report back to him that um, in the, the, all those questions, the answer was yes. And sure, there were disappointments I had to bring back, particularly the repeated loss of works of architects that Bob admired a lot, like J.R. Davidson and Thornton Abel. But I could provide with a lot, Bob with a lot more good news than bad. And we just the mention of the Thomas Mann House um, by J.R. Davidson, when we went on the market, everyone just assumed the worst, it was just gonna be bought and torn down. 
but uh, Bob was delighted when I was able to bring up the, bring him the story that, uh, of all people, the uh, German Republic bought it and, uh, to help preserve it. <clears throat> I began to develop an image of Bob and both Bob and David in the early years of the guidebooks as if they were scribes in the dark ages keeping a candle of civilization burning as the barbarian and savage the legacy of our built environment. <clears throat> and this was before our great preservation organizations such as the LA Conservancy and Pasadena Heritage were founded. This is when the identification of important buildings was often word of mouth, scattered notes, rumors. <clears throat> this was, uh, there were very few other enthusiast driven resources, no internet certainly. And uh, then came a local flurry of appreciation, of preservation action, of restoration, adaptive reuse. A renaissance of sorts was going on. Bob missed some of this because of, because of mobility issues, but <clears throat> his friends like Ann Scheid got him around the city just enough that he could take some pleasure in what was going on. And of course, it was his efforts with David Gebhardt and his work on Pastina or, pa or Los Angeles Historic Preservation Committees that really contributed to that renaissance. I had it easy working on this uh, guidebook in 2016 to 2018 because there is such a large network now of enthusiasts and specialists and all sorts of all the local facets of our built environment. But 30 to 50 years ago, <clears throat> Bob and uh, David were working almost from scratch. You know that uh, taking on the text of an old professor and mentor puts you in an odd generational place. Yes, I felt that sort of typical arrogance of youth as I sniffed out dated language and commentary about that they made about uh, our region, things for me to update or repair. For instance, there was that brief mention of Jack Benny's Anaheim, Azusa, and Cucamonga Railroad. I mean, what reader under the age of 50 is going to get that reference? But then I asked myself, who are you calling old? Um, here I was in my mid-60s, treating a work that came from a couple fellows who were 40 when they started it. Um, what we know now as LACMA was the publisher of the very first of the Gephardt Winter Guides in 1965. But for that edition, uh, the authors deliberately failed to mention the then new William Pereira buildings. Bob later wrote, being naughty boys, we thought that these three pavilions were so stupid that we did not include, include them in the, our guide. And of course, those buildings are now uh, in the news today as the museum prepares to tear them down for an, one massive new complex. And six months ago, Bob mentioned to me the irony that now he really wishes uh, those buildings could be preserved. Everyone in this room probably has some uh, story to tell about their experience of Bob's wit, his passion. Uh, I'm, I was lucky to get a nice dose of it in those last few years, and um, uh, I was to, greatly to my benefit. As we were um, in the printing phase, just last fall of the book, where things had calmed down, I, I decided to take a break from Los Angeles and did an East Coast uh, driving trip on my own, and Bob got very enthusiastic about that. He said, I made that trip seven times. So it makes you feel patriotic. <laughs> I mentioned that I would be touring Frank Lloyd Wright's Falling Water in Pennsylvania. And of course, he had a story about that too. Um, probably around the 1970s, he went there for his first time. There is a uh, conference in Pittsburgh for the architectural historians. And there was a field trip to Falling Water. And Bob, uh, as he approached the house and saw it for the first time, he said for all to hear, and now I can die. <laughs> and the story continued, actually, because uh, there's another field trip a day or two later, and he found himself sitting next to, uh, back to Falling Water, next to, he found himself sitting next to Edgar Kaufman, Jr., who was the son of the original client and the person most responsible for the preservation of Falling Water. So Kaufman would have been about 15 years older than Bob, and, and uh, Kaufman casually remarked to Bob that, well, well did he had heard that one of the historians from the conference came, saw the house, and said, now I can die. And Bob said proudly, that was me. <laughs> uh, when Bob passed away in November, uh, February 9, 
well-meaning friends would send me their condolences from my loss of a special friend. And I miss him, of course, but uh, I cannot claim any greater loss in Bob's passing than the rest of you here. What I can do is smile at how just 80 days before we lost him, the two of us made across the finish line uh, after three years of work on the new edition. And I only wish that our victory lap together would have lasted a little longer. Thanks. Hi, everybody. I'm uh, Joe Rohde, uh, class of 77, and uh, had a, a peculiar and sort of compartmentalized uh, relationship with uh, Bob Winter uh, for a period of time um, in the 1980s when I was working on this uh, mural uh, that uh, fragments of are out in the lobby. But, uh, of course, uh, I was also one of the people entranced with Bob when I arrived here at Occidental College. He was kind of the crystallization of what uh, Oxy was. Uh, he's also instrumental uh, in my wife and I getting together. My wife, Melody, who's here, uh, was a student in his... Um, course Apollo and Dionysus and was overwhelmed by the erotic force of his rhetoric and driven into my arms uh, as, as a kind of uh, symbol of Dionysus. Um, and we continue to uh, uh, live out this Apollonian and Dionysiac uh, paradigm um, to this day. <laughs> Uh, I made it to Oxy just on a raft of, um, you know, scholarships and work programs and grants. So it was really a stretch and it really a kind of an Oz uh, to, to be in a place like this. Uh, and this guy was kind of like the wizard of Oz, except that when you look behind the curtain, they're just more wizard and then more wizard uh, and more wizard. Um, and, and, you know... He introduced to me this idea of ideas, the idea that the objects that we inhabit are not objects, but they are themselves ideas. Uh, the idea that these ideas can turn into more objects, and then other people would be walking around inside these ideas. Uh, and this all became really valuable to me. Uh, when, I, when I began my career, I, I work for Walt Disney Imagineering. I work as an Imagineer. I design environments that people walk around in and that these environments are indeed ideas and, and I have been uh, enjoying to make those ideas be meaningful, uh, partly because of this whole um, experience of, of being imbued with this sense. So it, it, after hearing, imagine the, 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 um, the dignity and the quality and the importance of the work that went into the Batchelder house. Uh, here I am, I'm like 27 years old, I get a phone call from Bob. He's like, I'd like, I'd like you to work with me on a project, a very interesting project. And I want to take the Canterbury Tales, uh, and, but they're going to be enacted in the Arroyo. Uh, by, um, and, and here's the big secret, it will all be the literati of Occidental playing the roles, not just of the pilgrims, but in the tales themselves. Um, and I want you to do it. So just for a moment, imagine being invited to be one of these people whose work is now going to be physically embodied into this place. A place that started out as Ernest Batchelder's house, but now is Bob Winter's house, and is slowly changing its whole idea of what it is from only being that to now being this and this other thing. So you're sort of participating in the evolution of a thing. So it was a huge opportunity, one by the way, which in the end I was, didn't happen because the stuff is sitting out there. But it was a wonderful, uh, intimate series of meetings with Bob where he would rhapsodize about how this was going to be and he would vacillate in that Bobbian way uh, between like scurrilous, like, oh, we're gonna make, um, um, you know, like uh, Brignauer as the wife of Bath and we'll make Norm be like in the Miller's Tale. Oh, no, no, that's too much, too much. Um, especially if you know the Miller's Tale. Um, you know, uh, Clifton Krober can be the shipman, and, 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 but Lou Owen will be the knight. Um, and on and on like this. Who's going to be who, and where will we see them, and how will they be portrayed? But no one will know. Only we will know, because it'll just look like Can the Canterbury Tales. Um, and he had said, and he wanted it to be done, and this was the t horribly intimidating part. He wanted it originally to be done in the style of William Morris. Now, William Morris is famous as a printmaker uh, and as a, a, a textile pattern maker, but if you look at William Morris's paintings 
as a 27 year old, you would just think, I'm screwed. I cannot possibly hope to do this. Um, so I convinced him uh, that perhaps something that was more like a fusion between Arthur and Lucia Matthews and Batchelder himself uh, would be a more appropriate for the house. And this, again, is a very Bob-like thing to engage in a perfectly level, perfectly even-handed discussion with a young man who, you have talent, you're an intelligent young man, why yes, you could change my mind about how I want the mural that I'm gonna commission to be. Um, so we went on like this for a while with this multivalent discussion of this thing that was gonna go into the house. And um, I set to work upon it and I did all these full-size uh, sepia tone cartoons, one of which is out there of, um, I'm pretty sure that's Andrew Raleigh as Chaucer with, um, with myself and Bob as little misericords on the, on the projecting ends of the writing desk because he didn't want to be one of the characters, you know, Handy Nicholas perhaps. No, 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 that's too, too scandalous. Um, and, and so they just did this thing. It was really charming. And then, un unfortunately, I moved to another house. My studio space changed. My career changed. Just at the moment, I was beginning to paint the full-size version of one of the big um, um, pediment uh, areas. But it had a tremendous, and I think this is the, the tremendous lifting um, impact, you know, to be invited to be that person makes you that person. Uh, to be invited to participate at that level in a work of architecture with a person of that stature makes you that person. Then you are that person. You were this other person, now you're this person. You're a person who can be in the room and have that discussion and make those drawings that you didn't know you could make and, and, and potentially be installed into such a place that you never dreamed of being in. And that transfers to many other things. That transfers back into my career. That transfers into ability uh, that helped me move through the rest of, of, of my work. Um, and this is that thing that I think Bob had um, that is sort of, um, many teachers have, but the best teachers really do this. They are a source of propagation. It's not just that they instill ideas in you, which is kind of tyrannical, uh, but that they propagate you as a source of, of ideas. It's like a coral reef. Bob is kind of like a Baroque coral reef uh, of other people. Uh, and, and Bob's kind of in the middle there, now sort of the coral part, and all the polyps are all of us, and all the little fish, and all the reef fish that are swimming around, and all the new little creatures uh, that are emerging out of this vast fractal combination, unpredictable at the beginning, of the impacts that could be had by being that kind of person that can uh, propagate, that can um, not, just, not just teach, not just implant, not just in form, but cause new things to occur, cause new people to be made out of what they were before. And if we're here to celebrate a life, uh, this to me is what this life was, the fact that this life is not contained within its own arc, but actually uh, like an explosion, like a kind of blossoming explosion of other people, some of whom are in this room, many of whom are spread around the world, uh, and that at the epicenter of it is that singular beginning, that propagative beginning uh, of Bob himself and his capacity to make people into things that they never dreamed they could be. That is what I have to say. Thank you, Joe. That was really wonderful. Um, before we uh, leave, I'd like to invite everyone to a reception outside uh, on Thorn Patio. But it wouldn't be a fitting conclusion to the celebration of Bob Winter's life if we didn't get to hear one last time in the land of the bungalow. So with that, we're going to... Uh
I just got off the sunset train. I'm from the angel town, the golden west, Los Angeles, where the sun shines all year round. I left a girly back there. She's the sweetest girl I know. She said goodbye. I'll wait for you in the land of the bungalow. In the land of the bungalow, away from the ice and snow, away from the cold to the land of gold, out where the poppies grow, to the land of the setting sun, and the home of the orange blossom, to the land of fruit and honey, where it does not take much money to own a little bungalow.